I'm Luke Story. For the past 22 years, I've been relentlessly committed to my deepest passion, designing the ultimate lifestyle based on the most powerful principles of spirituality, health, psychology, and personal development. The Lifestylist Podcast is a show dedicated to sharing my discoveries and the experts behind them with you. All right, welcome to the show, you two. Thank you. It's it's Great. lovely to see you when mm. my mouth is not open under a bunch of lights. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not someone that's particularly scared of dentists, but I wouldn't say that it's my most comfortable, uh, you know, experience. So mm. I'm so stoked, and I was so happy to move here to uh, outside of Austin, Texas, and figure out after hearing about your practice for mm. so long that you were like 40 minutes away from here in Marble Falls. I was like, hot damn, man. I thought we only had weird stuff like this in California. <laughs> no, it's 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 so good to have you. You know, we've, we we feel like we've almost become the epicenter for people moving from California. So, uh we're we're we feel like we're in good company having you here. Awesome. Thank yeah. you. Well, I first I think found out about you uh from uh Nadine Artemis, a friend and a former couple-time guest on the show. And you seem to have uh, created this this practice here in Texas, which before all of us moved to Austin, I would say Marble Falls is relatively remote. But from what I understand, you guys for a very long time have had people traveling literally from all over the world to come seek treatment with you. Is that correct? It is. I mean, it's been incredible. Just the variety of people we've met and how much we learn from them and their health journeys. I think Dr. Nunley some of his story, you know, has drawn people in and just um, the teaching he's done about biological dentistry. So it is unique to have such a different group of people all venturing out to Marble Falls, Texas, of all places. All, yeah. the, all <laughs> the alternative health nuts that listen to the show. Um, I want to ask you too, what's the most exciting recent development in your field of dentistry? You know, is, is there something coming down the pike with stem cells or anything that's really cutting edge and, and hopeful that's, that's a huge leap forward? You know, I think, uh, yeah, I do think stem cells um, offer a tremendous future for dentistry because we're hopeful at some point we'll be regenerating teeth. And so what a, what a thrill that would be to grow your own tooth back from your own stem cells. And uh, so that research has been um, hot on the stove for some time, and I thought we'd be doing it by now. Unfortunately, there have been some real glitches. It's you can grow other tissues, but it turns out that a tooth is more complex than you would think. And so, uh, and yet, I still think there will come a time when we when we do regrow teeth. And, um, you know, that's that's one of those things in the future. But even now, there are so many wonderful things that we are able to do that we couldn't do a few years ago, especially through various various imaging techniques where we can image um the jaws from every angle that's a beautiful thing and also to be able to image things um whereas we used to take old old fashioned photographs now we image through these fabulous um machines that will reproduce reproduce teeth and jaws so accurately for us so that we can plan very, very accurately how we're going to reposition someone's jaw and the impact that has on their facial structure. So those things are fun. I, I would say right now is a hot time in dentistry for materials and new new techniques. It's it's really a fabulous time. It's what one of the many things that keeps me stimulated and enjoying dentistry. Yeah, I, I'm looking forward to the day when you can regrow teeth. I yeah. mean, you guys have seen the condition of my teeth. And out of out of any category of my physical health, I would say that's probably the weakest and one that I have the most regret about in terms of not listening to my elders when I was young. Mm -hmm. Oh, take care of you. I mean, I always brush my teeth, but I didn't go for checkups often enough. And mm -hmm. if my dentist, for example, recommended, um, at one point, one of them recommended I get a night guard. And this was just like this you know, Korean dentistry spot down, down from my apartment when I lived in that neighborhood. And it was going to be like $750. And I, and I thought they were trying to scam me because I just went there for teeth cleaning, but I went to a more holistic dentist for other work. I was like, ah, I don't need that. And then, you know, within a few years, of course, I'd worn out my teeth and 
Everyone said, why didn't you use a night guard? You could have prevented all this. <laughs> so I'm kind of holding out for you know, the stem cells or some sort of AI robotic thing that can help you grow teeth. But if you did it wrong, though, what if, you know, what if the tooth started like growing out the side of your gum and poking out of your cheek? So not something we want to mess with. Um, to give people a platform here, what's the basic, um, you know, the fundamental difference between uh, holistic or biological dentistry versus what we'd call traditional dentistry? What are, what are a couple of the fundamentals that, that make them different? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think really the most defining thing is that we really emphasize listening to the patient and spending the time to hear truly what their health journey has been and what their experience with dentistry has been. Because I think a lot of times, um, and it can happen in a in a more traditional environment, but it's difficult because you you have to have that a, a real value for the fact that if you're not engaging with the patient and hearing what their experiences have been, then you're not going to really know how to help them achieve what their goals are. So it's not often in a dental <clears throat> visit that you have your dentist or your hygienist say, "Hey, Luke, what are your goals? You know, what do you what do you want to accomplish today? Are you interested in?" having the health of your mouth influence the full body wellness, you know, that you want to achieve. Um, are you, have you read some of these articles about microbiome in the mouth and, you know, how that can affl- influence the rest of uh, your wellness? So it's, I think it's just more that we don't draw a line here <clears throat> and say that everything happening here in the head and neck is mechanical. We're going to, you know, save these teeth at all costs. This is all interconnected, whether you want to talk about meridians or you just want to talk about the fact that um, from a microbe standpoint or infection standpoint, we're connected. Um, That would probably be the biggest Mm -hmm. differentiator, wouldn't you say, Dr. Nunley? I think so. And Mm -hmm. then, of course, we pay real close attention to what materials we use because uh, for years, Dentistry, in my opinion, has been remiss about using materials that can have a real impact systemically. And so we're careful about that. We don't want to um, restore someone's tooth only to have it be a contributor to their systemic illness. So we watch that very, very carefully. And you know, there are labs, there are two labs that I know of in the world that can measure someone's serum against virtually every known dental material so that we can make sure that we're not doing something that's going to be harmful to their systemic health. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Two great answers. I think that really sums it up nicely. Mm -hmm. Because I think in traditional or allopathic medicine in general, it it has a tendency to be very um, reductionist and mechanistic, Mm -hmm. right? There's there's not this inner relationship between everything going on in your body Mm -hmm. or even going a step further, the psycho-spiritual element Mm -hmm. of, of who you are. So that speaks to your piece, Candace, about really getting inside that person's experience, yeah. right? And and how their dental health relates to that. So I think both of those ideas are, are really important. And, you know, it's, it's something we don't really think about in the old days of dentistry, right? You just mm-hmm. go to the dentist and they put whatever they have laying around, they throw in your mouth, and then you're living with that maybe for the rest of your life, whether it's, you know, the mercury amalgam kind of fillings that I'm sure we'll talk about or... Mm-hmm even the different plastics and composites. I mean, who knows what this stuff is? It's probably a lot of it's made out of things that you wouldn't eat. So if you wouldn't eat it, why would you put it in your mouth? <laughs> no, you wouldn't. You you sure wouldn't eat it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you but, probably have the inside baseball on some of the crazy stuff that, they, that they've used in the past and, and probably still are. Well, it's something the, the dentistry has much to be modest about. Uh, at the least, you know, we... Um, we have, as Candace said, for, for years, not, not just the public as a whole, but dentists in general have said basically what goes on here stays here. And that's... Above the neck is what he's referring yeah. to for those listening. Yeah. <laughs> Which is uh, incorrect. And so we, um, we have to be careful. I mean, you, you're going to live with it 24-7. So let's make sure we're doing something that's causing no harm. Yeah. Um, so you, you, as I understand, um, Dr. Nunnally, came into this under the tutelage of uh, Hal Huggins, who, mm. from my understanding, is seemingly the, the godfather of this area of dentistry. Perhaps either or both of you could illuminate um, you know, his importance mm. in this field and, and who he was. It's a name that you hear around a lot. I don't know that much about him, but it might be interesting as a starting point. Like, 
you know, who the who the pioneers were, and maybe there were others that I'm unaware of. Sure. Well, even before him, there was Weston Price, who was a fabulous researcher. He was a dentist, but a fabulous researcher who brought to light many of the things that we consider so important today. And and um, Weston Price, unfortunately, was also uh, shunned by the dental world. And uh, really, up until recently, much of his research has been uh, I think research has just been set aside and no one has ever in their dental training encouraged to read Weston Price's research, although it's some of the most fabulous research ever in terms of nutrition and in terms of dentistry's impact on our systemic well-being. So Weston was um, long before Hal Huggins, but Hal Huggins became familiar with his work and could hardly believe it himself. And Hal was a brilliant man. He was way too um, he was way too bold for his time, and it cost him his license. He began to tell people, of course, to have their mercury fillings removed and to have their root canal treated teeth removed. And he sort of brought to light this whole idea of cavitations, which are residual infections after having teeth removed. He raised all of these questions about dentistry and about the way it had been practiced for years. And it absolutely, um, well, it it did cost him his license. Fluoride, too. That was something I think that really wasn't that kind of of one of the main factors that caused him so much. Absolutely. And, you know, he just wasn't going to back down from anybody. So uh, I, I met Hal because I got sick myself 20 years ago. A friend of mine said, we thought I had ALS. It turns out I had mercury toxicity. I said, and my friend says, well, why don't you go see Hal Huggins? I didn't know Hal Huggins from Adam, but I had uh, <laughs> I had read a little bit of his work, and I was intrigued by it, and I had a background in biochemistry. I thought, well, I am going to call him. And uh, I'll never forget, the, I called him. I got him on the phone. I said, Dr. Huggins, you don't know me. Uh, but I'm a Texas dentist. It looks like I've got ALS. Would you mind seeing me? He said, well, I'll be in Montreal in three days. Can you meet me there? So at that time, he was seeing patients in Montreal and Puerto Vallarta. And he and I, I loved the time that I spent with him, the 10 days in Montreal. And we became dear friends. And I learned so much from how Huggins, uh, I had to a master's in nutrition, and he turned my world upside down in terms of nutritional principles. Uh, There's so much that he he, uh, taught and sowed into me that um, it wasn't long, and I began to help him in Montreal with his patients. And then he got tired of being in the cold, so he came to Texas to our office for eight years. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, cool. They came uh, once a quarter, brought very sick patients, always people who had all sorts of systemic illnesses, and we would do the dentistry, and then he would oversee the rest of their chemistries and so forth. So we, uh, we're we very fond of Hal Huggins. You know, he and to the moment he died, he was always controversial, and um, but We learn much, and even those things, um, Luke, that I would question about how, uh, I have to say, they've come to be the truth. Uh, I really feel like he was, and he was on a quest for the truth. Mm -hmm. There was no question about it. He would change it in a heartbeat if he realized that the data did not support, uh, good scientific data did not support his stance. But he wasn't going to back down from a bulldog if uh, he believed that he was on the truth. Well, it's it's crazy that, and you brought up fluoride, but it's crazy that we live in a society and, and in a system where it's even debatable, let alone cause someone to lose their license for questioning why we wouldn't advise putting mercury and fluoride into someone's bodies. I mean, these are two of the most toxic chemicals on the planet, you know, maybe below the the spectrum of radioactive materials, you know, I mean, this is really, really bad stuff. So it's just, Mm. it's crazy. And I remember years ago, I think when I first started exploring this area of dentistry, Was it not quite common that people would lose their licenses just for speaking out against those two things? 
Yeah. I mean, it was a bit before my time, but right at the time, this would be my 15th year with Dr. Nunley and Dr. Freeman. It was, it was kind of a leap, you know, because he had to sit me down and say, some of the things that we know to be true, we have to be very careful how we share those with patients so that we can continue to do that and help them. And so it was kind of mind blowing for me, you know, just coming out of dental school because I was like, wow, this is, this is really interesting. There's more going on here, you know, than just the study of dentistry and medicine. It's some, some complicated uh, layers of history. You know, even when he was talking about Weston Price, I think that was a time when, you can correct me, Dr. Nelly, but there was a division, you know, amongst dentists. He started to realize that he was not comfortable with doing root canals because of some of the evidence that he was finding in his research. And then you had another group of dentists that were like, well, this is a way for people who can afford it to keep their teeth. And we're going to kind of ignore the some of this inconvenient research. And it caused this split. Mm-hmm. And I think it, it still exists, you know, now. And uh, in this time, you've got a group of dentists who... We, we find out year after year that more and more of Weston Price's research gets validated. You know, with, um, I was telling Dr. Nunley at our weekly meeting that I just read the uh, Breath book, Nestor's book. I think maybe you've read it as well. I've, too. I've heard about it. I haven't read yeah. it yet. Yeah. And so in the book, there's a couple of times where he talks about uh, anthropologically, you know, studying skulls and facial development and ancestral diet that, Western Price's research gets validated now. So people are interested in it again. So it'll be interesting to see what conventional dentistry's responses to that. You know, right. now that you've got some orthodontists and other research scientists going, oh, okay, maybe there's something to this. The whole factor X thing, you know, mm-hmm. with Weston Price, mm-hmm. it came out that that was K2. Mm-hmm. I mean, just it just seems like every couple of years, don't you agree that Absolutely. some of these things that were considered oh, this is, there's not enough body of research here to validate this. It's just get little nuggets of it as time's going on. The thing, I mean, I haven't even read Western Price books or uh-huh. looked that deeply into it, but just from the photographs he took of people when he traveled around the world and you see that the dentition of, you know, indigenous peoples that hadn't been, uh, had their diets hadn't been adulterated by the Western diet. And they just have these huge broad smiles and they're super right. muscular. I mean, it's like, whatever those guys are doing, I want to do that versus, exactly. you know, people that had grown up on, you know, grains and industrialized food systems and all of that. I mean, it's kind of like the proofs in the pudding. What is there to refute when it, when it comes to the nutrition part, at least, you know? Absolutely. Well, and, and you know, uh, we still see that today. We see these children who come from, um, well, for example, we see, we've seen many, many Amish children over the years who have been fed, um, who have been fed these beautiful diets that their ancestors were raised on, unadulterated by the typical American uh, fast food and so forth. They have these robust skeletons and beautiful jaws. They can accommodate all of their teeth. Um, and I've been on, and Candace too, on many mission trips to various parts of the world where um, you'll, see, you'll see children who have been on their indigenous diet and their parents, they accommodate all their teeth. They're perfectly aligned. An orthodontist is not even known in that part of the world. And as soon as they get off of that diet, within one generation, they have rampant dental decay, and they have no room for all 32 teeth. Now they can barely squeeze 28 in. And it's, it's still today, if we had to say, what's the one thing that creates the greatest issues for our dentists? It's, it's nutrition. It's lifestyle. And um, if you want to really get back to the basics and have healthy children, you get them back onto an ancestral diet and keep them off the traditional American diet. And you'll, <laughs> before you know it, you'll have your a robustly healthy child. Yeah, give it a couple generations. Well, yeah. it's funny, you know, I was thinking about when I was prepping the notes for this interview, 
I was trying to recollect back to when my teeth went south because when I was a kid, um, I, I never had any cavities. I didn't have braces. But I had perfect teeth, right? Um, I did have, it was recommended that I had a couple wisdom teeth removed. So maybe mm-hmm. I wasn't ancestral enough to have a jaw big enough to accommodate mm-hmm. all of my teeth. But when I became a vegetarian, which was a, a roughly 10 year period or so, uh, my teeth all rotted out of my head. You know, so I, I wasn't eating meat. I wasn't getting, you know, the B vitamins, no K2. I mean, I wasn't vegan, so maybe I ate some cheese sometimes, but I certainly <laughs> certainly wasn't eating tons of grass-fed butter or natto or, you know, any of the, I don't know, just any foods that are that are rich in that. And looking back, there's definitely a correlation between that period of how I chose to eat with, you know, good intentions, of course, but I, I mean, my teeth just went south so fast. Well, that's, a, and that's exactly what Weston Price said. And it's what Hal Huggins preached. In fact, Hal would never settle on a particular diet for for anyone or on a a diet that was a fad diet because he says you can't determine anyone's nutrition until you look at their chemistry and until you look at their ancestry. And over the years, I looked at hundreds and hundreds of chemistries, blood, hair, and urine chemistries with him. And... When we would, for example, let's say we had an Asian patient who came in who had decided that they were going to eat lots of meat. They'd come to the U.S. and maybe they were throwing in all, all kinds of things. Their chemistries would look terrible. And then we would have a patient the next day from Germany who decided they were going to become vegan and abandon meat altogether. Their chemistry would look terrible. If you switch those two where you get them back on their, both on their traditional diets and the Asian is eating mostly vegetables and maybe a little smattering of meat and other, of fish and other, their chemistries improve quickly. And the oh, wow. same way for the Europeans, you take them back to what their ancestors ate, their indigenous diet, get them a little meat have a tater or two in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's funny because I'm, I'm a European mutt, I guess, you know, yeah. the best way to describe it. And my body, everything about me feels better just eating basically steak and potatoes. You know yeah. what I mean? Like Me too. That's pretty simple. When I deviate from that, it's pretty clear right away. I can tell through my digestion that mm-hmm. I'm not meant to eat that. Not that I, it keeps me from doing so sometimes because, mm-hmm. you know, Cracker tastes good, you know what I mean? Totally. But yeah, that's that's very telling to go back to uh, the ancestry. I think that's that's actually good advice for people. There's all these mm. diet wars, you know, the vegan, carnivore, paleo. I mean, I'm just over it. Maybe look back, do some research. What did your grandparents eat? Where were they from? And kind of follow that. Um, anyway, I don't want to digress too far off into that because I have so many very specific questions for y'all. But let's tackle the big elephant in the room first, I think, which is the amalgam feelings, you know, the mercury exposure. This is becoming more widely known, yet I still see people all the time with a mouthful of metal. So maybe you guys could just kind of break down um, how that came into use um, and how widespread it still is and what are some of the repercussions. And then beyond that, let's talk about um, safe ways to have it removed and some of the risk perhaps of, of not doing it properly. Mm-hmm. Why don't you take that? Sure, yeah. Um, So the biggest thing that we inform patients of when they come in and we're talking to them about amalgams is that they're 50% elemental mercury. So when I was in dental school, it was taught to call them silver fillings. And there's very little silver in there. There's a mixture of metals, but it comes like in a little cartridge where there's mercury just like in a thermometer. Like if you dropped it, you'd have to hazmat, you know, all the things or like in a light bulb. And it gets shaken up into this other uh, powder of metals and packed in your tooth. So the biggest exposure that you would have had is when it was packed in, like blood and urine wise. And then after that, you know, mercury rich layer comes to the top, then over the life of having the filling, you are still having some off gassing of mercury coming off. But the agencies, uh, to be unnamed, will say, oh, it's not a significant enough dose of mercury to be concerned. But then I think in 2020, they came out and said, we really don't recommend it for pregnant women or children under a certain age. Wow! There's a little wheel on the IAOMT you can look at and it shows mercury vulnerable populations, but it's not well known. You know, there wasn't any type of campaign to be like, hey, let's let people know that. Yeah, I didn't see any billboards. You should tell your (laughs) dentist, you know, that you shouldn't have mercury. 
And it was all more aimed at placement. I don't know as much about the history. Dr. Nunley may know more about how it came to be used as a material. But in my time of education, it was like, well, this is the durable thing. This is the easy thing to place. Uh, There were a whole lot of reasons why it should still be offered. But it just really didn't make sense. You know, even if you stepped back, um, there was a lot of focus on the how to do them well and, you know, what, uh, how to make them look good. But there really wasn't a lot of time talked about what they really were made of. So it was a pretty easy jump for me, you know, to not use it anymore. It, never, it always kind of felt icky, you know, it was like, and then when I had children, I remembered some young people that I had done amalgams on. I was in a practice where certain insurance wouldn't pay for resin composite fillings and I didn't know any better. So I was placing them. And all this amalgam junk would go in the floor of the mouth of these kids. Well, that's where I give my kids homeopathy. And, you know, it's a very vascular area. It really made me kind of sick. You know, it was like I had these people, I was putting all this mercury junk in the floor of their mouth. I'm sure it was going in their bloodstream and probably even in their lungs, you know, inhaling some of that. So it just, to me, I don't think there's any place for it in dentistry with some of the more biocompatible and structurally awesome materials that we have. Is it safe to say that anyone who opens their mouth and has fillings that are metal are that type, or are any of them that are kind of silver-colored, you know, a different amalgam of metals and don't have mercury, or is that just universally what's used? I'd say it's universal unless they have a gold restoration that might be confused with, because those are metallic, of course. But for the most part, if it looks dark, it's a mercury-based uh, filling. And, you know, um, it never should have been used in dentistry. Candace hit on the reason it was. It was cheap. Um, anybody can put one in. You can stuff one in with your thumb. <laughs> you <laughs> the know. tooth doesn't have to be dry. You know, you just put it in there. Yeah. Yeah. And it lasts. <laughs> it lasts and lasts. It'll last until the last microgram of mercury falls the out in the whole thing because the mercury is what kind of It'll holds probably it probably last together. longer than most of the people who have them in their mouth. <laughs> probably. Sadly. Not to be morbid, but I, I mean. <laughs> well, that's right. <sighs> um, and then what about, um, you know, if somebody has, say, a crown and sometimes you'll see an old crown, you see a little metal underneath it or something like that. Yeah. Is this toxic material also used in other types of? Of course. Okay. Of course. And, and you mentioned gold teeth, like if someone has like a gold crown and it's a fashion statement, is there likely mercury in that too? Or? It certainly can be because many of the mercury fillings or the teeth that they were in failed. And so the dentist would then put a crown on top of that. Oftentimes using not only the tooth, but the mercury filling as a base for for something to, for the crown to sit on. Uh, okay, kind of an anchor then to put mm-hmm. the white colored, you know, yeah. faux tooth on. Or, you know, you can get you can get just about everything dentistry has to offer in one tooth if you're really after it. <laughs> you can get a you can get a, a mercury filling and a gold crown. And you might even the tooth might die and then you might have a root canal through the gold crown. You, so you can have a tooth with a mercury filling, a crown and a root canal all at one time. And maybe you even put a little stainless steel post in there to make sure it's really A trifecta strong. of failure. Yeah, you're a walking... Toxicity oh, trifecta. Oh, there you go. Oh, that's so brutal. Well, <laughs> something else about the metal, and, and I totally don't know if there's any validity to this idea, but I've always been opposed to having any metal in my body because I understand how it acts as an antenna for radio frequencies. I remember you guys probably, maybe at least... Dr. Nunnally's old enough to remember, I don't know about you, but if your TV wasn't getting a reception, you just add more metal, you know, tinfoil and stuff onto the antenna. And I thought about that one time and I thought, huh, you know, if we're even wearing metal jewelry, you know, some would say would uh, cause this to happen. In fact, one person I interviewed, Jack Cruz, he looked at me and I used to have these two gold earrings. And he said, man, you know how conductive gold is? I said, so what? He goes, dude, your brain is a walk, you're a walking antenna for cell towers. Yeah. And he's a he's a brain surgeon, so I you know, I took that to have some validity, but I continue to wear them until I recently lost one of them and I didn't <laughs> want to wear one in here. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um do you do you think there there's any risk of, you know, having metal in your mouth for, for that particular issue or 
Absolutely. Okay. Because we can measure those currents. Oh, no kidding. We can measure them. Those are galvanic currents. Okay. They're very, very well known in the literature. And we know they're disruptive to those natural currents that are running through us through every meridian in our body. Those currents are disruptive, and they're many-fold higher than the currents, for example, that our brain or our heart run on. In fact, we measure these in microamps. Our brain runs on nanoamps, so we're about a thousand-fold higher with these currents in the mouth than we are, for example, on our particular brain impulses. So, oh, you know, we it's not uncommon, Luke, to see patients... Um, you know, who complain of, for example, seizure activity. After they've had various forms of dentistry that have different metals, and then then to have those removed and see the seizure activity go away. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, this is a bit later in my manuscript, but while we're on the topic of metals, I might as well just throw it in here. Uh, when I yeah, I had a missing tooth for a number of years and it became problematic because I wore down all my teeth on the other side because I could only chew on one side. Uh, so I, it took me years to actually get it done because of the expense and just the trauma involved in that type of surgery. But I didn't want to put a titanium, you know, post in my jaw basically. And so I was waiting for the, uh, what's it called? Zir- Zir- Zirconia. Zirconia. Yeah. I was waiting for that. And then finally got that. And Dr. Villarreal, who's been on the show way, way back, uh, another biological dentist in California, he said, well, let's send you to uh, this bioenergetics type guy that had some device and it's kind of like muscle testing, but with a device basically. And and we tested the titanium and it it did in fact cause a reaction. And so we went with the zirconia and, uh, you know, I I haven't perceived any problems, but would would the implant, you know, the metals used in implant be an issue in terms of, of that or anything else in your biochemistry or your body's electrical system? Yes, so both. The first thing that comes to mind for me is with the titanium implant, you do have a certain level of titanium ions coming off into the bone from that, and it makes a zone of inflammation. So it's not really the current issue, but that's that's also an issue. We definitely encourage our patients if they're able to. They're, we work with a great implant placing doctor, and there's typically three options. There's titanium, there's zirconia. And then there's one that's a hybrid of the two. It's got zirconia on the outside and titanium in the core. The biggest thing that we want to avoid is taking out one source of infection or inflammation and putting in another. So there are many people that a titanium implant is not appropriate for them. Having that zone of inflammation, if they're on the connective tissue disease spectrum, like our fibromyalgia patients, our RA patients, anybody that's really struggling with body inflammation, we don't want them to have that. You want to talk a little bit about a little further with currents? I and think that, meridians? and then too, we know, and I'm not a good muscle tester, but people who do that and we, who we really trust, they'll, without, without fail, they will say that the titanium implants disrupt those normal channels of communication. And so um, we avoid titanium implants, and um, we think patients do much better with zirconia. And typically, those also those people who test um, muscle test well, and we think do a good job of it. They usually say the zirconia tests very very well in terms of energetically. Yeah, yeah, and, and both both not only energetically, but also, um, chemically, you know, it's, it's about as chemically inert as you can get. Cool. Cool. Mm-hmm. Well, I got to say my implant <laughs> is my favorite tooth. You know, it's strong as hell. It's white, <laughs> totally. doesn't get cavities, doesn't chip. It's at times <laughs> I fantasize. We're going back to the stem cell thing. I'm like, man, I wish it wasn't such a traumatic event to have that. I mean, it was one of the worst things I ever went through. It was, oh. it was brutal. Uh, despite, you know, the nitrous oxide, anything they gave me, it just was no match. Um, but I thought, man, when they figure out how to do that right, I'll just put all new teeth in, you know? <laughs> but you know, Luke. it's beautiful. I mean, it's a perfect tooth. <laughs> it is. But you know, um, your experience is not what it should have been. Okay. It should not have been brutal. Okay. It should have been one where you hardly knew you had it done. Really? Yes. Okay. So yes. I went to a bad, what is it, an orthodontist? That mm-hmm. does well, I'm not sure surgeon. which one you went to. but I went to some place in Tijuana and a little shack, you know, to <laughs> yeah. save save a couple bucks. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, I mean, it, you know, I'm, pro- I'm over dramatizing it, but mm. you know, the, the vibration of the drill and your, I mean, it's also mm. the mental uh, aspect of it. You know, what's being done. And if you're conscious enough to kind of know, then it, it psychs you out too. You're not you know? over dramatizing it. It's okay. really important. You know, we, the autonomic nervous system and keeping our patients calm, um, not having them flood with stress hormones. It's important, you know, cause that's gonna, it's gonna set your body in a state of healing or a state of, ah, you know, run from a bear, like you're saying. And then also kind of imprint that groove in your mind of like, Oh, dentistry trauma, you know? So we do take that pretty seriously. Even, all the way to the way that our patients wake up from a procedure. That's still important. And I don't know when you're in the office, you probably didn't meet our acupressurist because, you know, it's, there's a lot of us there. Yeah. But our acupressurists start and they set the tone. So before we even do a sedation procedure, they're working on calming the patient's nervous system. So by the time they get to us, it's not uncommon for them to say, oh, I already feel like you gave me something, like I'm sedated. And that's right where we want them. You know, we want everything just to be the slow drift and the, you know, I'll tell them, you know, in the next seven to 10 minutes, you're just going to start to feel deeply relaxed and you're going to be lost in your own thoughts. And then you're going to wake up and this is all going to be done. Like this toxicity is going to be gone. Uh, We're going to have everything done. You're not going to have to worry about a thing. And I think that greatly impacts our patients' healing results. Yeah, Because they'll say, I can't believe I don't have pain. And some people, we're all different. Some people will wake up the next day and um, come and report some discomfort. But many times they're like, what did you do? Because I'm not experiencing what I thought I would, you know, the day after surgery. Mm -hmm. Well, I did notice in in going to your office that it's a much different feel. The whole experience is much different. I mean, it's... Mm. Like the space is well designed, it's comfortable, it smells nice, it doesn't have that kind of sterile, cold, <laughs> scary dentist office <laughs> feeling. You know? So you guys, I, and I haven't even experienced the acupressure part of it, but just walking in, everyone's super friendly. It looks nice, it's clean. You know, it's just it's much different than experiences I've had in the past. Um, but let's talk about the removal of these type of feelings. You know, I, I always caution people to really, and, you know, do some research on who, who's going to do this for you. If you, if you realize, wow, I have mercury in my head and I want to get it out. What are some of the things that people should be uh, mindful about in terms of actually making their mercury toxicity worse in the process of the extraction? Well, um, I'm going to really just cut, (laughs) cut right to the, the chase here because there's a protocol that's been developed to, to remove these properly. And it's very well established now, and it is published on IAOMT website, IAOMT standing for, for the International Academy of Oral Medicine and Toxicology. And they use the acronym SMART to stand for Safe Mercury Amalgam Removal Technique. If a dentist is certified in that, they have gone through the training that Hopefully, they're using that training to then remove a patient's mercury filling safely. If, if they don't, you should report them to the IOMT, and they'll be removed from the website. Well, the IOM, IOMT takes it that seriously. And I think it's a great step forward in, in producing something that now the public has access to, and they know that if I go to a dentist who's smart certified by the IAOMT, I should be able to get my mercury fillings removed in a safe manner. So um, if you don't have them removed using those techniques, and we like that technique plus several other adjuncts added to it for added safety, but if you don't do that, um, you're going to get a mercury exposure similar to what it was when you first had them put in. You're going to have a spray of mercury throughout your oral pharynx and you're going to absorb some of that and that too is well well documented in the literature and you can it takes months to years to lower back down to baseline once you've had that kind of exposure so uh, i would really encourage people to go to that website iaomt.org We'll put that in the show notes, by the way, guys, and that'll be lukestory.com slash dentistry. So we'll, yeah. we'll link to that. 
Okay. Uh, I remember vaguely when I had it done, uh, and I'm hoping they did it right. Uh, I've tested my mercury levels since, and you know they were moderate. I don't think I was terribly exposed, but I remember there was all of this uh, kind of suction stuff going on, and pe- you know the the providers were wearing masks, and it was seemingly a very sterile environment, and there were a lot of apparatus um, involved that wouldn't have been there for a typical procedure. You know, so is is there some kind of you know suction to make sure that it's not getting into the air? What are what are a couple of things that yeah. a dentist would use if they're following that protocol? Absolutely, it'll be listed on there, and I think it's more than twenty different protective points. But we can kind of start with the patient. So we cover their hair. We use a rubber dam, and many times a suction device underneath that rubber dam is like the stretchy thing. It kind of looks like gloves, and you pop it over the glove material. You pop it over the tooth, so only the tooth is sticking out that has the mercury. Then we're using a high-speed suction, a lot of water, the patient's covered to where none of their skin can get some of that splash of mercury. The providers also have their hair covered. They have on um, protective gowns. Hazmat suits. Yeah. (laughs) I I warn people when we sedate them, I'm like, okay, if you wake up and you think you've been abducted by aliens, no, you know, it's like we have all this stuff on. We wear respirators similar. It's like a painter. Right, right. That's what I recall. There's something up here, you know, by your face that kind of looks like a elephant trunk and it's a extra suction device for the air. Negative ion generators catching mercury, you know, if it gets out of that field. We do a chlorella pre-rinse and post-rinse, an IV vitamin C, and that's all just like belt and suspenders. Like nothing should get underneath all these layers of protective um, gear that we're using for the patient and for us. But if anything did sneak through, then you've got the chlorella binding in the, the vitamin C. And then we also are protecting the environment because, you know, we've got kids and grandkids. We don't want this junk going into the water and then into the soil and into our food. So we separate it out of the water, um, dispose of all the amalgam laden material properly. Right, yeah. right. Cool. Yeah, we, you cool. know, we literally, it's hard to believe, Luke, but, you know, when we take these fragments out of the, out of the mouth and we, um, we we have a collection of them. Some of them are so big they you know they don't go into our suction and where we retrieve them from there. But they're little chunks, and so they're put into a a glass container, sealed, and then we have someone with a hazmat license come pick that up. Wow! But um, today, if you went to Chicago and walked into the American Dental Association and said, hey, what do you, how do you feel about mercury fillings? They'd say, well, you have our blessing. <laughs> it's hard to believe. So you can put it in the teeth, but you can't put it into the wastewater. Right. That's I, crazy. So and, you're allowed to put it in someone's mouth, but if you remove them, you can't just throw them in the, in the garbage oh, <laughs> outside, no. of the, outside of your practice. Oh, no. So, that, that, that has to be carried off by a hazmat. Oh, dude. Yeah. What a crazy world. Yeah. I love having this show just because yeah. I'm always just shocked by how insane human beings are. We're just the weirdest creatures. We are. Um, okay. Then when it comes to the, the, the uh, microbiome of the mouth, I did have one kind of niche question as we go into that. Um, and that is what effects did, did you see during this whole masking charade? Were, were people having any different experiences in terms of their dental hygiene as a result of wearing these, you know, masks for two weeks at a time and pulling them out of their purse when they were supposed to wear one, et cetera? (laughs) We both feel strongly about this, but he pointed at me because we did another podcast and I talked about mask mouth and it's a legit thing. I mean, when people, I had patients coming to me asking, would you please write a letter, you know, to my employer because you're showing me, I'll back up a little bit. When you come to our office to have a hygiene visit, we take a sample of your plaque and we put it on a slide and we put it under a phase contrast microscope. So you can actually see what's going on with the whole little world of microbiome critters, you know, around your your teeth. And we would have patients who their slide looked one way. They were doing the same home care. You know, they'd be water picking, taking great care of their teeth. They had to wear a mask for work reasons. They would come. They had gingival inflammation. The microbiome was totally unhealthy, disrupted. And the thing that's just so frustrating about that is if you have, it can make you more prone to pneumonia. It can make you more prone to upper respiratory problems. 
So just like you were saying, it's this funky mask in the bottom of your purse and, you know, you put it on and you're breathing your own air. It's so disruptive. I know that's like a big, big brush explanation, but we saw it in the microbiome. And then it was really frustrating because we just know how important having an imbalance there at the, at the tooth and gum level, it does affect your lungs and your digestion. Yeah. So right. not good. Yeah. No, no, uh, no doubt that um, masking was, was a, uh, was a terrible error in the whole treatment of the, of the uh, disease. And we got to see it firsthand through the microbiome of patient's mouths and this uh, inflammation that amped up and you basically were breathing through your own little uh, Petri dish. And um, (laughs) so, uh, yeah, you know, to analyze one of those masks, it's literally crawling with bacteria. And, uh, of course, it's not crawling with viruses because the viruses dash through it like it's nothing. And it is nothing to a virus. Like a mosquito through a chain link fence. (laughs) Oh, and another thought, too. It encourages mouth breathing, you know, because your nose is a bit... I notice whenever I wear a mask clinically, I'm breathing through my mouth. And we do not want that at all. You know, we want nasal breathing. Mm -hmm. And so... Even that alone, I think it can mess with your nitric oxide production at the base of your tongue. It was just a whole cast. We probably don't even know all yeah, of the Yeah, I was just I was curious to see what, what you found clinically mm-hmm. there. Um, speaking of the breath, you asked me a very interesting question at one point when I came in and I was kind of whining about the sorry state of, of my, uh, my teeth in general. And I said, yeah, there was this one point where, you know, I just started getting all of these cavities. And you asked me, you said, well, do you have, at that point, did you have uh, uh, issues with heartburn? And I was like, yes. And I was a vegetarian, I was eating tons of grains and I just had acid reflux all the time. And especially when I was sleeping, why, why did you ask me that? And what effect does acid reflux have on your teeth? Sure. So when you look at teeth a lot, you know, every day for many years, you start to notice patterns. And we know if we see something that kind of looks like somebody took an ice cream scooper and went in the tops of your teeth and we see these little wells out or we see a certain pattern <clears throat> along the sides of the teeth where maybe somebody sleeps dominant on that side, it's because some of their stomach acid is creeping up into the mouth. And stomach, stomach acid is one of the things that really can damage enamel in the mouth. And so you showed some of the signs of that back there. And so that's kind of more back to that first question. We're looking at what's going on with your teeth, but our wheels are always turning. Like what else is going on here systemically? How can we coach this patient to better protect their enamel or make some type of nutritional or gut, you know, little tweaks that might help them have healthier teeth? Got it. Yeah. Yeah. I I remember that brings to mind uh, hearing about people that have suffered from bulimia and one of the signs of that being tooth decay. Absolutely. same, Same deal, huh? Oh, yes. From you're just, you know, passing all of that acidic stuff through your teeth all the time? Yes. Brutal. Okay. Um, on, in another part of the microbiome issue, what role, if any, do uh, parasites play here? Is that something you guys come across when you're doing, you know, these scans of, of people's biome? Of course. We see amoebas routinely, especially and not necessarily in, in the unhealthy. We see amoebas and uh, it's the main parasite we see when we look at um, their microbiome under a microscopic slide. Um, but it can be in a healthy person who eats um, fresh veggies right out of the garden. You know, you can pick up an amoeba. Unfortunately, when they get between the tooth and the gum, they like to chew around on our gum tissue too. So we, we, amoebas are not something that we care for. That's the main parasite we see. Um, the other, the other um, little critter that we dislike the most probably are uh, spirochetes that we find in the uh, oral microbiome because they not only they not only are harder on, on our gum tissue, but they're also they they love our gum tissue, but they actually love our coronary vessels and our heart and our cerebral vessels and our brain even more. Really, so they're very well documented in the literature in terms of their their contribution to heart attack and stroke. 
Oh, so that reminds me that a, a friend of mine had that scan done at your office and had the spirochete show up. And I think you guys recommended a, a water pick mm-hmm. with some peroxide or something. Uh, and I got to check with them to see if they followed up with that. Because I think it was like, ah, this is kind of a pain in the ass. Is, <laughs> what's the big deal? You know, um, and just thinking about gum health and I think their gums look fine. So they were like, eh, I don't know. It's that big of a deal. But that's that's very telling there. Yeah. Okay. Just as we said, right? Nothing's isolated. If it's no. going on in your mouth, it's not a neck up issue here. No, they 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 love to enter there and then off they go swimming toward those other places that they enjoy. Right. Mm-hmm. All right. Damn spirochetes. Mm-hmm. Um. What What about the jaw alignment and um, sleep apnea and things like this? I did interview. I guess I've done two two um, um, shows on dentistry. Another one was with the doctor Jennings out of Oakland and. Mm-hmm. He, I don't even think he does fillings or any of that kind right. of stuff, but he just focuses on getting your your jaw right and has discovered that it's at the root of this thing called substance P, this inflammatory marker, mm-hmm. and there's a whole thing. So I get a lot of questions from people about this. Is that a part of your practice at all of you know helping someone to actually get the shape of their their jaw back in alignment and, and that whole piece? Well, it, it's not only because we just don't have time for it but we recognize it. And again, it usually stems from a nutritional issue early on or even from a nutritional issue in the parents of the person who now has these small jaws and their inability to breathe and their inability to oxygenate properly. So we recognize it, and the Dr. Jennings that you're talking about, who you interviewed, of course, is a, a leader in that. Oh, so you're familiar with him. Yes, okay. yes, absolutely. And But, you know, now and more and more, it's very, very well known. And if you can intercept it at a fairly early age, especially in children, uh, they're able to wear appliances that help their jaws expand. And that, combined with a good nutritional uh, regimen, can be very very helpful. Okay, cool. Yeah. Cool. I'm glad. I'm glad we got to cover that. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see here. Going back to the nutrition piece, it seems that K2 is is one is the thing that Weston Price was you know onto, and it took some time for everyone to figure that out. Is there anything else specifically in terms of a uh, supplementation that someone might be mindful of, like getting I don't know retinol from cod liver oil or or any of these? really key nutrients to dental health? We really love vitamin C. And oh, okay. Yeah, so Dr. Nunley has a naturopathic degree, so I'm going to let him jump in at any point. But okay. I kind of, I know his secret sauce, I guess. Um, so in terms of systemically vitamin C, vitamin C, you know, that's the big one. We give it an IV dose. We always encourage people to have, it's going to sound redundant, but that ancestral diet of whole foods and getting food source, um, really good quality uh, calcium. And then um, recently, I've been kind of interested in, because we don't use fluoride in the practice, it's not really a nutritional thing, but having some hydroxyapatite that's um, sourced, like New Zealand sourced, contacting the teeth. I'm really interested in how that can remineralize. It's exciting because... What's that called? Hydroxy appetite. Oh, okay. so we get asked all the time. It's kind of going from your question here about nutrition, but people are like, "Well, what kind of toothpaste?" And so yeah. for years, we've had a recipe on the website trying to help people avoid some of the bad things. You know, the more toxic things you'd get in a commercial toothpaste, like microbeads and fluoride and triclosan, all that junk. So we've kept it pretty simple with like a baking soda and salt and peroxide. But I'm, I think we're going to tweak it a little bit. And we found a couple products. Um, there's a lot of talk about nanohydroxyapatite because it's these little teeny particles that can get in to your enamel. It, we've kind of treated decay like it's a fluoride deficiency, you know, <laughs> and it's... It's not. Oh, man. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, so our teeth are not made out of fluoride. They want, <clears throat> they want stronger hydroxyapatite whenever you've got this biofilm that's attacking them. So there's, there's a good way to be able to administer that. You can order, uh, this may be get, getting a little too nerdy here, but there's some controversy about the nanoparticles because they're so small. Like, where else can they go? 
So there's a aura wellness company that has a crystalline hydroxyapatite and they feel like the particles are small enough that you can absorb them in your saliva, um, but not so big that they can't be used by the tooth to remineralize. So we're pretty into that cool. right now. Mm-hmm. What about pearl powder? Have you guys looked into yeah, that at all? Yeah, we like that. Yeah. As well, Dr. Nunley is very familiar. Mm-hmm. And then um, in terms of the, what are they called? Spirakeets? Spirakeets. Yeah, <laughs> that just sounds creepy. Mm-hmm. In terms of the, the spirakeets and, uh, you know, the harmful bacteria, parasites, all this kind of stuff, would something like a colloidal silver or uh, essential oils, oregano oil, would it make sense to add some of that to your brushing routine sure. or hygiene routine? Oh, yeah. And and those are all helpful, but typically the the pathogenic bacteria live in an anaerobic area underneath the gum line where no oxygen is really uh, able to get. So that's why if you're going to use something like hydrogen peroxide or even um, colloidal silver, you want to put it into a a water pick where you can jet it under the God, because they're just going to hide out under the gum. They're going to bury. They're crafty. (laughs) They're very Uh, crafty. Yeah, because they're trying to avoid the oxygen anyway, right? That's right. Okay. Yeah. All right, that's cool. That's very good information. Um, in terms of, uh, I guess let's get into you know root canals and extractions and, and wisdom teeth. I know like mercury, fluoride, and we don't even have to get into fluoride. Just everyone listening, don't put fluoride in your body. It's pretty simple. <laughs> don't let go. your dentist do it. They try to give you sometimes that little fluoride toothpaste, you know, when they do their cleaning. I'm always like, no. But uh, something people ask a lot of questions about is, you know, when is a root canal, if ever valid? What are the alternatives? When do you know a tooth is just a lost cause and you have to extract it and perhaps put in an implant uh, afterward or something? So let's let's wrap on that a little bit. Well, I'll take that one. Um, it's still probably the most controversial issue uh, for a holistic dentistry is because if, for example, we say all root canal treated teeth need to be removed, well, then you pose a whole new set of problems. How do you replace it? It's difficult to replace it um, the way God put it there in the first place. And even though you're very, very comfortable with your zirconia implant, some people are not. Um, So how do we, and and not to mention the the cost, all the ways, I mean, we can replace teeth in a beautifully aesthetic manner, but the cost, the time, um, all are factors that we have to think about. So, and the good news is, um, good news and bad news, it's good news for most traditional dentists is that you can do a root canal and the average life of a root root canal in the United States is 11 years. Well, you wanna hang on to the tooth for 11 years? Most people say yes especially if they don't know any of the caveats regarding the root canal. If the dentist has not told them that you have a 40% chance, or at least worldwide, 17 studies have indicated, if you have a root canal, you have a 40% chance of have a, having a blatant infection at the tip of the root canal. The root canal may still sit there, but you have a 40% chance if you have a what's called a cone beam exam or CBCT exam done, there's a 40% chance in the 17 studies, thousands and thousands of patients around the world, 40% chance of that root canal having a blatant infection. And then if you know that if you have that blatant infection, you have a 530% increased risk of a cardiovascular event. Well, how, how, how anxious are you going to be about going and having uh, another root canal done, if you know that you've got 40% and you got 530% increased risk of a cardiovascular event. So there, there are all kinds of reasons. Here's the point that we should make, I think, and that is patients should be informed. The dentist should simply take the time to inform the patient. And if the patient, say, for example, Luke is going to if they maybe maybe they're 80 years old and they've got five root canals and they're as healthy as a horse. Well, maybe if if let's say now another tooth's gone bad and if they don't have the root canal on it, they're gonna have to go to dentures. Well, that might be a case where a root canal, you know what? Maybe a root canal is indicated there. But you have a 25-year-old who had a root canal 
a year ago and now has MS. And now she needs another root canal. Now we might want to start thinking, has this root canal been part of the problem in her MS? We don't know. But over the years, there's been great documentation by physicians and dentists around the world to show that when root canal treated teeth were removed, systemic health conditions, especially autoimmune issues and cancers, uh, went away. And so we're all so individually, um, so individually gifted in terms of our immune systems and in terms of our um, health in general that we ha it's a very individually based um, question for us. M the the issue that for us is that most times physicians have referred their patients to us, encouraging us and the patient to have the root canal treated teeth removed because uh, they feel like it's compromising their systemic health. So, are there, are, with the root canals, uh, are there other issues uh, apart from cavitations, which which we can talk about in a moment? Because the ca the cavitation, as I understand it, I think I had a couple at one point, and I had them, you know, cleared with ozone or whatever they did. Mm -hmm. But you have an infection then that's down in the jaw, right, which can turn systemic. Uh, so that would be one. Are there other implications to root canals, though? I think for the most part, you've hit on it. Um, a root canal treated tooth, by definite by definition, is dead, and it's not sterile. So if you have bacteria in anything in your body with no way to deliver a blood supply to it to keep it in check, then you have those bacteria in a beautiful, warm, anaerobic environment. They're, they're happy. They're very happy. <laughs> they're thriving. They're very happy. They do thrive. And now uh, we know the toxins that are released from these. They're incredibly potent. They're not only deleterious to your immune system, but they're deleterious to your, um, well, certainly they're deleterious to your um, brain. And we even know I'm thinking just now, as you asked me the question, I'm thinking of a, a new article that was just published that talks about the severity of depression being associated with uh -huh. root canal treated teeth. It's because the toxins have a uh, an affinity for neurological tissue. So we have to be very, very careful about root canal treated teeth. I think some people obviously seem to tolerate them fine, just some people can tolerate most anything. And when is a, a root canal typically encouraged? Is it, you know, you've, you've had a tooth that's had a cavi cavity and then it's been filled a couple times and, and it just keeps getting cavities and then it gets so deep that you kind of have no choice but to drill out into the roots and essentially kill the tooth? Is that kind of the, the sequence of events that leads one to that conclusion? Sure. If you present with a tooth where the tooth decay has gotten to the nerve and any dentist can see, usually in 2D, they're checking. We like to look in 3D because that just gives us a little bit more information about what the pathology looks like, you know, down at the end of that root. But by the time the cavity gets to the pulp of the tooth and the tooth is dying or has died, you don't really have any choice. You can't just put a filling in there. So you have to make the decision, are we going to root canal or extract? I think something that I see often is crack teeth, you know, that um, someone will have a crack or they'll have a crown and it, and it stresses the nerve of the tooth and then they end up with a root canal. And that's concerning for us because if there's a crack in the tooth, that's caused structural failure. The only way that root canals actually um, stay any semblance of uh, sealed is if it's sealed. And if you have a crack, then it's hard to understand how these really smart microbes are not just going to get in there and, and, like you said, thrive and make right. toxins and inhibit enzymes. And there's actual real research out there that supports that. Okay, so if you arrive at that destination with a problem tooth, you're really left with two options, root canal or extraction. Yes. You are. That's your tooth is toast. Yeah. Okay. Is there a way to do a root canal properly? I know you guys use ozone, which I was really excited about because yeah. I love ozone for so many things. <laughs> we do too. <laughs> is there a way to do a root canal that ensures you don't get a, a cavitation in there? There's not a way to do one where you can ensure that the root canal is sterile. Okay. 
when there is, we will be back to doing root canals. Okay, okay. Um, I'll add one caveat to that. What if, what if we are able to get the root canal system sterile? What assurance do we have that it's going to stay sterile? Uh, okay. Once again, you have this dead entity, and we think of teeth as being solid as a rock. Well, they're hard, but they're still porous. Uh, under an electron microscope, they look like honeycomb. Really? Yes. Wow. So the bacteria have ways to get in there, especially in the mouth, for Pete's sake. There are all kinds of ways they can. It's like getting on an I-35. <laughs> <laughs> right. So even if you're properly mm. sterilizing while the procedure of a root canal is being done, there's literally no guarantee that it's not going to become a problem later. There's not good research to show that six weeks, six months, a year from now, the root canal system would remain sterile. If you could get it that way, got it. There are there are some great. There's one in particular, great endodontist, who I have a, a dear relationship with. She's in California, and she she just does such amazing work in the in that field of endodontics of root canals, and she's doing everything I think possible at the moment to try to get the root canal system sterile, and that it, and using ozone, of course, but. Uh, my challenge to her is we no one knows how long it's going to stay sterile if you ever get it that way. And to this point, unless it happened in the last few days, um, a root canal system cannot be sterilized. Okay. And then what about extractions? Uh, if, if the root canal is not something that appeals to you, which I'm sure is going to be the case for many people listening. Uh, so in my case, for example, I had the wisdom teeth were crowding my teeth, and so I got a couple of them extracted. And that's where I ended up years later having cavitations found. So mm -hmm. I'm assuming there's a, a more of a guarantee with a complete extraction to sterilize it at the site when the extraction's done, have the gum seal over it, and you, you should be good to go. Is that correct? Or do you still want to kind of kind periodically of. <laughs> check for cavitations under where an extraction took place sure. just to make sure that nothing's brewing in there? I think this is where we'd recommend that you find a dentist that's uh, familiar with the fact that cavitations can form, you know, and has been exposed to that type of research. Because if you, we'll just pick a first molar. We won't do wisdom teeth right now. But if you take out a molar and there's a ligament that runs around that molar, and then you've got this really dense bone that holds your teeth in place. You know, we want, them, we want them to be there and be secure when we need them. When the tooth is extracted, there are a couple things that need to happen to ensure that the patient's going to heal optimally. So you want to make sure any infection associated with that, you know, this little bundle we're talking about that would warrant, you know, the root canal, it's abscessed, that that comes out, that the ligament comes out, and then that you even, it sounds a little aggressive, that, but you scrape away some of that bone there because it's not terribly vascular. And common sense tells you you want really good blood flow to that area. So the couple of biohacks that we do are, number one, our patient's body is set in a state of healing, which can sound kind of woo to people that are not, you know. Probably but not I, people listening. Not your people. <laughs> no, I know your people are yeah, they're, they're good They're probably with this. like, can I take ayahuasca before <laughs> I get treated? <laughs> <laughs> Might be even better experience, yeah. Um, but you know, the average person who's not familiar with what we do, um, that's important to us. You know, we want to make sure that they're set in a state of healing then we want to thoroughly clean out that infection, what we can see with our eyes. And then we're using ozone, you know, to go in and it's going gonna, it's gonna to blow up the cell walls of any of these pathogens, any bacteria or virus, anything in that socket. It's just a, the best adjunct we can use to the platelet-rich fibrin that we're going to put in that socket. So we've stimulated it to bleed by, you know, getting it really cleaned out well. We've put the ozone in and we've cleaned it the best that we can. And then right when our patient's going to sleep, we draw blood, we spin it in a centrifuge, we get that platelet-rich fibrin layer, pull it out like in these kind of gel plugs. You can go on Instagram and see biodentists doing this all over the world. And we pack that in and we put a little suture over it. They're having a vitamin C drip. And we've done everything that we can do with the technology we have today to ensure that that patient's going to heal. Cool. So you're using yeah. PRP. Yeah, it's a little that different. Oh, yeah, okay. it's PR, PRF. There's nothing added to it. It's okay. just purely spinning that blood. We throw those red blood cells to the end of the tube and we get that PRF layer. And then by putting that in there and suturing it, we're controlling the soft tissue's not just dumping in there and your breakfast and 
everything else, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, because if, if you're Get just... Get a cornflake stuck in there. <laughs> <laughs> it's unfortunate. But uh, so it's just... It's just the best we can do, you know, to help yeah. you heal there and and not form a cavitation because you've gone to all this effort to not do a root canal. You right. want your body to be optimally well. So, cool. Okay, yeah. cool. I got a, I got um, many more questions. I'm going to get through as many as I can here. This one's a, a personal. Uh, my question for you is, has anyone figured out a way to whiten teeth without ruining your teeth? It's all kinds of, you know, blue light white things coming out now. And I haven't really kept up with it, but my teeth have grown quite yellow. I know many people's have. Is there anything that works that it is safe? The, the, interestingly enough, the materials that are even used in crest white strips, that's carbamide peroxide. As soon as it hits saliva, it converts to hydrogen peroxide. There's just a gel there that holds it in place. <clears throat> There, there's very little research to suggest um, that if you do it moderately, that you're going to harm the teeth long term. So almost all gels, all bleaching gels at dental offices around the world have carbamide peroxide in them. And the problem is, and the reason it gets a bad rap, and quite frankly, we didn't bleach people for years because we were concerned about, are we going to are we going to cause problems down the road is that the gels and the bleaching solution was too intense and people would leave with very, very sensitive teeth, which might occasionally lead to a tooth that goes south on us. So all that being said, I think as long as a patient uses a bleach, a bleaching gel of 10%, maybe they go up to the 16% if they're, not sensitive to to the gel, then they'll be okay. Okay. So I I, I used to at one time believe mm, we should never bleach anybody's teeth. I've changed to believe for the most part it's safe. Okay. And then what about these blue light devices and things that I've seen lately? Is any validity to those? I used one last night. Somebody gave me uh, our hygienist came back from a show and they had this like paint on product with the light. My husband was like. What's in your mouth? You know, it's like this strange thing. I don't really know how evidence based that is. Like, I to me, it felt like it just set the gel. Um, okay. So I don't know as much about that as I should, but uh, yeah, it's really a trend right now. You know, put the bleach on, put this light in. Sure, sure. So I okay. felt more like it was setting the product than actually like doing something to the enamel. Okay. Yeah. So we need more research on that. <laughs> uh, is tongue scraping legit and and critical to oral care? I think so. T tongue scraping is yeah. legit, and some people have way too much plaque on their tongue. And so just using a tongue scraper can be very effective. Does that tongue scraper need to be copper? Does not. Okay. And then what about oil pulling? This is another yeah. popular one. Is this doing anything useful? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. So we have tons of patients that oil pull uh, coconut oil, typically. I think it's the, is it the lauric acid that's in there? There's mm -hmm. a component that is antimicrobial, you know, and then of course it has ancient roots, uh, Ayurvedic medicine, but the mechanically pulling that oil through the sulcuses of the teeth, you're going to be pulling out some of those unfavorable microbiome critters. And then hopefully you're going to repopulate with more beneficial bacteria. So it's cleansing, anti-inflammatory, helps with microbiome. Cool. Don't spit it in your sink. You'll clog your sink. <laughs> that's really? Oh, that's funny. Spit it in yeah. the trash. Oh, yes. That's <laughs> funny. I was reminded the other day to not, uh, I was reading something from, I think, our water company or something. And it was like, don't don't flush uh, bacon grease down your sink. And I was like, oh, it's my, because my wife, Alice, the other day, like, make sure don't put that in the sink. And I didn't, you know, just to respect her. And I was like, who cares? <laughs> so that's a real thing, putting fat into your plumbing. Okay, yes. that's good. Um, what about gum recession? Is there anything that we can do about that? Well, it depends because uh, most gum recession, quite frankly, is from gritting and grinding teeth. Oh, okay. It's as if you um, go out here and take a fence post and you you try to wiggle it loose out of the ground. The ground will crater around it, and so it does with our gum tissue around our teeth. So actually, a, a night guard, again, can be helpful because many times that occurs primarily when we're sleeping. 
But it can also happen, of course, when we're under any stress, driving or whatever. My mine got much better, quite frankly, when my kids hit about twenty five years. Old. <laughs> Less stress in your life. Yeah, yeah. that's funny. What mm-hmm. about those little uh, sticker, you know, kind of stickers they put up in between your gum and and uh, and tooth? Do those have any positive effect on getting your gums to drop back down? No. Okay. Fake news. All right. Good. Um, someone asked, "What about using frequency uh, to kill the bacteria and parasites in your mouth?" It certainly can be done. Um, I'm not a, I'm not real knowledgeable about it, but I'm very interested in it, especially with my naturopathic degree. We, um, we, we delve into that some. But I, I, I know that. Uh, in fact, I just had this conversation uh, last night with a fabulous, um, with a fabulous naturopath in Arizona who was talking about using various frequencies in dentistry. So I think that your um your listener should stay tuned i think we'll have more information on that very okay. soon yeah cool cool yeah i have mm-hmm. a bunch Good of frequency question. devices you know rife type things and oh, yeah. mm-hmm. stuff like that so i'm definitely a believer in the ability of certain frequencies to render other biological organisms inert exactly right, through resonance so it's i mean it's it's actually pretty scientifically grounded it's just it's it a matter is. of which devices are legitimate and which aren't and how do you know who who set the frequencies and how do they really know those are the right ones? You know, that's, that's where it gets a little tricky. Oh yes. Um, we covered the gums. Ah, someone asked, why do we need to fill cavities in baby teeth? thought that was interesting. Yeah, sure. So we want to make sure we're filling them with something that's healthy for the child. And so I would say that's the majority of pediatric dentists are using white fillings. So go for that. But it's important. Our baby teeth, hold the place to help guide the proper eruption of our adult teeth. And when we're talking about everything we can do to put our children at advantage for arch width and not having the jaw grow like down and back, you know, we want this forward jaw growth. It would be a detriment to lose those baby teeth too soon. And it would Uh, also be really distressing for a mom to like watch their child have an abscess as it crosses over, you know, I mean, (laughs) that's, I'm a mom. So it's like, that'd be terrible. You just, you don't want that to happen. So it would be worth filling them with a biocompatible material. Okay, cool. And then someone asked, why do I only see tartar buildup behind my four lower front teeth? Yeah, he's like, go for this one. Um, There's a salivary gland down there that has, there's a lot of minerals available in the saliva. And so most people, that's where they have most of their tartar buildup. It just dumps those minerals there and they can easily calcify and turn into that hard tartar buildup, not the soft stuff, you know, you have after you have pizza or something like that and you go to bed without brushing your teeth. It's a, it's a mineral buildup and everybody builds up just a little different. It is influenced by the microbiome, but it just has to do with that gland there. Okay, yeah. cool, cool. Uh, someone says, uh, is it true that if you have a healthy liver, you don't have to worry as much about a root canal? If you have a healthy liver, you don't have to worry as much about anything. And the problem is, you know, our livers, especially in this country, are not typically that healthy. But the um, in, in terms of root canal, I know of no published data that suggests that. I would say, though, the liver is our chief detox organ. And so we want the liver and the kidneys uh, to be functioning well and everything will do better. I, there's no there's no data, though, to suggest that a healthy liver is going to lead to less root canals. Okay. And then uh, last one here. Are crowns necessary? Do they decrease risk of infection in a cracked or damaged tooth? In a cracked tooth that's symptomatic. Like it doesn't just look like there's cracks in it. That's where you have to really trust your dentist. You know, you want to find somebody that has the same philosophy that you have, because if you've got a symptomatic cracked tooth and it doesn't show up as abscessed, then we would recommend as conservative a crown as you could possibly do. And I know that's kind of upper level, but um, it could keep the tooth from cracking to a point that you end up losing it or have an abscess. So, um, we always try to do the most conservative and the most biomimetic thing that we can do in our practice just because we don't have root canal, you know, in our back pocket to bail out anything that's a little overzealous, <laughs> yeah. you know, so we're like, yeah. we want to keep these teeth alive. Well, I noticed yeah. your conservative approach having been to your office a number of times now, you know, <laughs> I, I kind of admittedly walk in and I'm just like, fix them all, just do all the stuff. Not like I have the money to pay for that, but 
you know, and you guys, I think both of you independently said, you know, let's just wait. You're, I know you think your teeth are pretty shot, but they're, they're hanging in there. Let's, let's just see how it goes, you know? And so I, I appreciate that in the context of the statement that you just gave, but for someone who's overzealous, you know, I'm just like, ah, crown them all, you know, <laughs> let's want pretty functional teeth again. But I, I think it's smart and maybe not great for your business model though, for you guys to be so conservative. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, obviously you're doing it right. You got people coming from all over the world to see you. Uh, well, thank you too so much mm-hmm. for, you know, not just being here today, but just for doing it right, man, and, and moving the ball forward for people that are starting to become aware of this and creating, you know, an incredible practice that I personally experienced. And I'm, I'm just glad you guys are here. Mm-hmm. I'm glad we're able to get the word out to people so they can get a greater understanding of this because we're really, as you know, coming out of the dark ages of dentistry. I mean, it's just shocking what we were doing just a few years ago and, and many dentists in the world are still doing, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so thank you for your commitment to, you know, the holistic approach. Uh, that said, for people that, that are uh, interested in traveling to Texas to come see you guys in Marble Falls, where do they find you and how does that happen? You can go online and you can find us at uh, Nunley Freeman and Owen's Healthy Smiles for Life. And the best thing to do is just get into contact with one of our treatment care coordinators, and then they'll just take it from there. Okay, cool. And then if someone is uh, elsewhere in the world or doesn't have the possibility of coming here to Texas, what's a a couple key words or something they should look for if they're seeking out this type of approach to dentistry? I'd go to the IAOMT website, IAOMT.org, and there are dentists around the world now and physicians who are members of that society, and it doesn't necessarily assure you that you're going to have a completely holistic experience because people become members and don't necessarily become the learners that we all want. But I would say that's a great starting place. Okay. And then you could the your listeners could go and interview the dentist and see if they feel like it's a right fit. Got it. I think that's a great idea. I mean, even if you just got their perspective on some of the low-hanging fruit, right? Yes. Mercury fillings, uh, use of fluoride, just willy-nilly root canals, knowledge of cavitations, a lot of things we've covered here today. Exactly. Okay, cool. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. I know you got a patient to go take care Mm -hmm. of, so we'll let you out of here, but appreciate you coming by today. Thank Thank you, you. Luke. Thank you. It was a privilege. 